Views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. If you were around on 9-11-2001, then you remember it as the day the world changed. And you will also remember it as the day we had illustrated to us all in the most dramatic fashion imaginable that the people who protect us in New York City every day are our first responders. Courageous and unwavering, tens of thousands of them came to our aid on that day and in the days that followed to clean up the massive toxic refuse of war. Since that time, an incredible 90,000 of them were exposed to contaminants as a result of the attack on America, many of whom have died and many of whom are literally still fighting for their lives. One of them will join us tonight. A bill just passed the House of Representatives to provide funding for their care, and it awaits Senate approval before being sent to the White House. Tonight, we honor those first responders with a program about who they are, what they did, and how are they doing. We'll also examine pending legislation and what the past and future holds for these incredibly heroic men and women. He was an EMT on that fateful day, and he suffered with an illness as a result. He's also a well-known and much-beloved photographer and all-around great Bronxite. My buddy Joe Conzo, Jr., nice to have you with us. Hey, Gary, how's it going? It's always good to have you. Always. And also the managing attorney for the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund from Barash and McGarry who are known as the lawyers for the 9-11 community. It is Mr. Lee London. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Joe, um, let's just start with memories. Here we are 18 years later. 18 years later. And a half. Yeah. Um, w w when you think about that day, what do you think about and what do you see for what you uh, what went through? I remember that day. It was a beautiful Tuesday morning, you know, primary day. I had to go vote, you know what I mean? Um, working on my ambulance, you know, and uh, getting the call about a, a plane into uh, the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. And being an EMT, PD, whatever, we're adrenaline junkies. We have to be there. Right. And um, where, where were you at the moment? Were you up here in the Bronx? Right up here in the Bronx, on my way to St. Barnabas Hospital with a patient, mm -hmm. and I called my dispatcher, and she says, you want to go? I go, yes. And I was assigned, and uh, my ambulance was I, one of the first ambulances from the Bronx. Well, down and when you got down there, what did you see? I mean, what I remember vividly is the thousands and thousands of people running away from the burning buildings. And you ran, let's and, be fair, you ran, you and drove and ran the hundreds the and, the, and the hundreds of, you know, EMTs, police officers, firefighters. Yeah running towards the burning building. Mm -hmm. That will always stay etched in my mind. Uh, what's the first thing you did when you kind of got on the job? Well, the first there? thing you do when you get there is you, you park the ambulance and you find what's called the triage area. You find somebody with, you know, uh, superior than you for directions. And um, we did. And my partner and I, Billy, came across, you know, the chief. And we were directed into the Marriott to start evacuating people at that time. And that's when uh, I was buried alive. After the first tower, literally, literally, literally wow. buried me alive. Feared for your life. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and you pushed, dug your way out. Dug my people? dug myself out. Um, looked for my partner, who didn't follow me in under a table. Try to outrun the falling building, and you know, broken collarbone, broken leg. Found mm. him evacuated him to, you know, the small boats that were coming over from Jersey. And I commandeered a uh, Parks Department gator, and I stood with that gator for 18 hours transporting patients wow. and stuff. Um, 
were you aware, did you think at that moment that maybe 18 years later you'd be saying, gee, I got sick and now I'm... I'm I, Gary, I mean, you, not... You can admit what... what I, I don't want to uh, pry, no, you but can, you can say no, what... No, it's okay. Say um, what you've I've got. been retired a year now from the fire department after 27 years, and I just recently got diagnosed with liver and pancreatic cancer. So I'm in the middle of... I've done eight chemo sessions. I have four more left. And um, if it wasn't for the love and support from family and friends, I don't know where I'd be at. And if it wasn't for, you know, the WTC programs that we have going on now, you know, I don't know where I'd be at. Friends, uh, colleagues, others uh, yes. who perished, who got ill, or just yes. give us a roundup, and then we'll bring Mr. I London mean, into listen, the conversation. that day, literally, if you ran left, you lived, and if you ran right, you died. Yeah. Um, 343 members of the New York City Fire Department perished that day, along with hundreds from the police department and, and all the other uniform mm. services. And since then, I, dozens and dozens of coworkers, literally from EMS, from the fire department, have perished mm -hmm. and died or are still suffering today. Uh, Mr. London, over the course of time, now maybe the morning after on 9-12 and 9-13, Joe Conzo was still down there and, and so many of the other first responders were down there and he may not have been aware that he had been stricken on that day of, of you know, of, of a, what potentially could be a terminal disease. Um, that's one of the issues here in figuring out how to fund it, right? Because the numbers keep growing, and there was kind of no way to say, okay, we'll put aside a billion dollars or $5 billion. Then all of a sudden you find out eight years later we need more, and then, of course, into the future even more. Talk to me about the creation of the various funds and how difficult it's been to lay it out and get it well, right. You make a great point because with the Victim Compensation Fund and the need for it is the fact that these cancer rates are growing exponentially. These are cancer diagnosis on steroids. So when first responders, when the 9-11 community acted on 9-11, they didn't hesitate. They went right in there to save as many people as they could. And then the after cleanup effects is they didn't ask any questions. They did their service, did their part. And what we're asking is for the Victim Compensation Fund to be permanently extended. And when I say permanently extended, just like the World Trade Center Health Program. So when the 9-11 Zadroga Act was created, it was broken down into two entities. You have the World Trade Center Health Program on one side and the Victim Compensation Fund on the other side. The Victim Compensation Fund is set to expire December of 2020, and that's why we are pushing for the fund to be permanently extended. So we don't have to march to D.C. every five years and ask for more funds because just like Joe over here, his cancer came out of nowhere, is aggressive, and this isn't something that we can predict. These are cancer diagnoses that even the health program is stating they will only grow from here. Do you get the sense, uh, and, and certainly we know that John Stewart uh, <clears throat> appeared before Congress and you know made an impassioned plea. Um, you know there there have been a, a, a it, it would be hard from a moral perspective to even think about denying it, but from a realistic perspective. Uh, is there kind of a sense, gee whiz, how much money can you put into it? Uh, you know, I, I mean, how, how, do, how do you view it and how do you argue it to people who are, from a realistic point of view, monitoring our, uh, our this funding? Is, this is a moral issue. This is something that the government said the air was safe. The government told everyone to go back. They opened up Stuyvesant High School. This doesn't just affect first responders. This affects the workers, the community, students, teachers. I think there were, the number was uh, that I saw was 410,000 people exactly. may have been affected, and aside from the 90 uh, who were first responders. John Stewart, John Feel are unbelievable advocates yes. for the 9-11 community because they bring it to the forefront. You, you mentioned, and, and I remember it distinctly, that, well, you know, the air is safe and all that. Is that really the kind of the germ from the legal point of view to say, hey, you told us it was safe, well, so that kind of makes it easier to sue and do all the other it's things? Not a, it's not about making it easier. These are people's lives. The facts speak for themselves. The cancer rates speak for themselves on thyroid cancer, pancreatic cancer, male breast cancer. Yes. You know, our firm spearheaded awareness of male breast cancer in the 9-11 community because my boss, Michael Barish, saw the exponential rate of male breast cancer. One in 100,000 people should be getting male breast cancer out of the community. If there were 400,000 
responders, sur survivors, community members, we alone already represent over 20 people with male breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So that's why these toxins, you can't explain, but we have to get the benefits where people need them. If this bill that's currently, uh, that's passed the House and currently on the floor and moving to the Senate, if that gets passed, do you not have a, a quote unquote fight anymore? I mean, do you well, feel no. like that would, I mean, it doesn't answer the health questions and you'll still have to m manage people's, you know, situations, but is that is that the, the golden bullet, you know, the silver bullet? What we need to do is, th this is no time to celebrate either because the cancer diagnosis will still be there whether or not the fund is extended or not. The whole point of what we're trying to do is add that little bit of relief to the 9-11 community so when they're going through their hospital treatments, when they have that overending fear of, will I be next? Am I the next person to be diagnosed with something? They have that relief that they know that the government, that the community is behind them. And that's really what this is all about. Your website has, and I, I thought it was curious because I have, um, uh, you know, been around a little bit. You have a 24-7 chat line. And 100%. I was curious... And presumably for people who, you know, fall sick or have a problem, uh, does it does it get busy? Do you get responses? Uh, my firm is available 24-7. So people will write in at midnight to the chat. They will write in all throughout the day and night, and we are there to answer their questions because this isn't a regular um, type of claim. This is a claim that affects the person. It affects family members. It affects widows, friends, the community. So mm -hmm. we want to be available to our clients, we want to be available to the 9-11 community 24-7. Um, we brought Joe Conzo here specifically to tell a first-hand story, but also put a, a face on it. And, and frankly, as I said, everybody knows Joe. He's been a photographer for many, many years and, and, and you know, um, much beloved. Um, once you understood that you were ill, was it a difficult process for you to say, well, I, I can verify that I was an EMT on the job, uh, you know, it, or it, was it a struggle to get yourself? No, it wasn't okay. a difficult process because, A, I was part of that group of union and, and, and first responders back in the early, you know, right after 2000, right after 9-11 that pushed for, you know, the registry program to come to fruition and things of that nature. So I knew the process. I was a big advocate and traveled, you know, I was the poster child for the fire department, traveling the country, advocating. Yeah, I think there are pictures of you and some of the You know, and advertisements, and you know. So I knew what to do. I just didn't think I would become. Mm. Of course you never considered that. Never considered it, you know what I mean? And so when I finally got diagnosed with it, I knew what I had to do. You know, we at the fire department, we get, you know, we go to our annual, you know, WTC monitoring, you know, uh, program. So when I got diagnosed, the first thing I did was brought the paperwork to the fire department and said, what do I do next? So, you know, I got certified and, you know, my benefits in terms of, you know, uh, were taken care of. They, they were taken care yeah. of you. But then you need to look at, you know, um, in other words, uh, Detective Luis Alvarez, of course, who... who it's a shame. It. It's, it's a shame. just terrible. Yeah. Um, uh, do you talk to people who are still having issues? And then, you know, do you look forward and say, gee, maybe we can clear this up? Well, you know, I've been retired a year. I still get phone calls, uh, you know, from, from members, you know, who I've helped in the past or who knew of me. But, you know, I still have active duty members, you know, like, uh, you know, EMT Gary Smiley, you know, EMT Yvonne Sanchez, who are on the forefront with Lee and his firm and, and the Feel, John Feelgood, you know, foundation, who are going up to Washington, who are pushing, who are helping other members who wake up one day, you know, with these signs and symptoms and say, oh my God, you know, I think I have something. So. There's, there's, there's an army of people out there helping. Uh, do, you, do you feel resentment that it has to be a political fight? Like, wouldn't, wouldn't you rather, I know, I know you're a very <laughs> soft-hearted guy, but wouldn't you rather just say, hey, look, we did it, and, and Listen, you know, I was almost buried alive. Listen, Can't you give me a break here? It, it, it's sad that in this day, in this political climate, that everything is made political when, you know, when I responded, and you know the hundreds and thousands of other people responded. Not only in New York, 
but in Washington and in Pennsylvania right. and, and all over. You know, we didn't hesitate. We didn't, like, take a, a, a second go, okay, if I get killed, is my family going to get taken care of? If I become ill from this? And my, we didn't hesitate. This is what we did. This is what we do. And to, to have people, men and women, in positions to even question our loyalty to our job, or to our commitment that day, to America. It's, it's a smack in the face. Mm. It's a smack in the face because I didn't see none of them running into the attacks. You, you described it perfectly as you said, I saw people running this way and then of course I said that you, know, you, you were moving forward. I will tell you um, from a personal point of view, I suppose you know we think of our Army and Navy and Air Force and, and um, uh, Coast Guard as the protectors of America, it really, for me, on a personal level, it wasn't until that day that I realized, I said, wait a minute, Th these men and women are really the front, that's why I opened the show with it, these are really the front line of who's protecting us. If something happens, yeah, maybe eventually we'll get the Coast Guard in here or we'll get the Air Force in here. But when something happens, it's but, FDNY, know, NY, NY. And so I learned, um, it, unfortunately, a tragedy. And I think there were many people who were like, wait a minute, these, these men and women are it, you know? I, I, I'm just mentioning that. That's a personal. And, and, and thank you, Gary. Thing. I mean, listen, this is something, you know, that I wanted to do. I, I was a combat medic in the Army. When I got out the Army, I joined the fire department, you know, um, became an EMT slash medic. And this is something I, I enjoy doing. You know, mm -hmm. I enjoyed saving lives and delivering babies for, for a living. You know, I was a civil servant worker. You probably felt some very difficult, but some satisfaction after of course. that day. You said, wow, yeah, I really Of course. You know, I made a difference. You know, you make a difference in somebody's life one day, that's great. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, 9-11 came, and, you know, we responded mm -hmm. without hesitation. I mean, people came from, that weren't, were off duty that didn't have to, from their homes. Well, you said they asked you, and you said you did. Yeah. Um, Mr. London, let's, um, uh, is it the bean counting that, that is in the way here of, of just having it just fly? Is it politics? Uh, I mean, what is it? I mean, he's, uh, Joe has made a very compelling case. One would wonder what's the whole. Well, Joe makes a great point. He didn't hesitate, and that's why we don't want Congress. We don't want the Senate. We don't want anyone to hesitate for the 9-11 community. And the biggest issue that we are having is how fast things move, meaning we don't want the saying it'll eventually get done. The cuts are happening now. Um, the special Just describe that specifically when you say cuts are happening. Okay, so the special you said it expires December 2020. 2020, but in February, the Victim Compensation Fund Special Master made an announcement that they're already going to start 50 to 70 percent cuts. Mm -hmm. So, since this is already in effect, I deal with clients, widows all the time that are already suffering the horrible effects of this fund running out of money, and the cuts are already happening now. So what this bill will do... I'm so sorry. I really want to break this down. So when you say the cuts are happening, so somebody has a doctor bill or a medical treatment, uh, and, and you submit it or they work through you, we, we, so what gets cut? Do they say, well, we'll only pay 50% of the $20,000 bill? I'm talking about through the Victim Compensation Fund. I so see. through the Victim Compensation Fund and the benefits that you get through the Victim Compensation Fund for various different claims from economic loss of loss of earnings to pain and suffering awards, they're all being cut currently by 50 to 70%. So, wow. And this is something that six months ago, if you filed and gotten your award prior, you weren't cut at all. So that's what's happening. We have friends, you know, colleagues. Why am I cutting not this person? It's because of the funding, and it's affecting people now. They, they have to decide whether to pay for their next chemo treatment or send their son to college, and that is not something I want them to decide. That is, that is a, <laughs> that's a ridiculous choice. So the numbers I have in front of me, 22,400 claimants have already received payments from the fund. An additional 17,600 remain under review. And they project uh, that maybe another 18,000 or more would be filed uh, after October 1st. As I mentioned earlier, it's, it's growing. And I sp uh, again, I don't want to offer sympathy to the bean counters, but there's a reality there. And then the other thing is uh, uh, supposedly House rules require that 
uh, spending would have to be paid for by cuts to other programs or tax programs. I guess your point, and, and certainly Joe's and his oh, colleagues. I, I can point. tell them where they can cut to, to keep this funded. Well, You're well, welcome. It's, it's an simple. open forum. Stop sending our money to other countries to shore them up. Mm. You know, let's take care of our people first. The, it's the it, facts that speak for themselves. The cancer rates are going up. Even Joe was just diagnosed with a horrible cancer condition. It was only a year ago, which is a fascinating, sad, of course, but fascinating. These yeah. are, this is cancer on steroids. So this isn't even something that you can wrap your head around. This is something where I see first responders walking in the halls of Congress every five years begging for this fund to be extended, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the begging when literally the facts show every day of cancer rates growing in the 9-11 community. And last month, um, Louis Alvarez's brother said it best, there were 16 funerals in the 9-11 community mm. just in the past month. Mm. So that just shows you that not only are people getting diagnosed, but they're passing away due to their 9-11 conditions. And we don't want them to have this extra stress on them while we're waiting for this fund that should have already been passed. Uh, we have, um, we taped the show a little bit earlier in the day, so now we're on Monday and we're a little earlier in the day. There's activity in Washington right now. Do you have a sense, and, and so by the time it airs, which will be 9 o'clock Monday night, do you have a sense of what might be happening? I mean, have you been on the phone with anybody? Where of course. Well, there was a, a press conference at 9.30 a.m. this right. morning. Um, it passed the House, but it needs to pass the Senate. Mitch McConnell needs to set a date of when this is going to go to the Senate as a standalone bill. We don't want any issues that we've had in the past. Like to combine it with another exactly. bill, and then that one gets held yep. up. And so then we... attach it. We don't want any issues. We want to get it before the August recess, and we want it to get done as fast as possible. As, as I understand, he said uh, that it's n it's a non-political issue, which is, well, in this day and age, of course, is very rare, a relief yeah. to hear. And the, the, what I had heard prior to coming in here was that they were talking about by the end of the week. Do you think that's realistic? We hope so. We hope so. And another part of this bill is, is that once it is passed and fully funded and extended, which is what we want, it'll make everyone whole again. Everyone who got those 50 to 70 percent cuts, they'll be made whole again once this bill happens. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of emotions. There's a lot of, um, you know, timing questions. But the biggest thing is, is that it has to be done before um, the Senate goes into recess in August, and that's what we're hoping for. Um, Joe, uh, what's, what's the lesson here? Is the lesson for, I hate to say this, for first responders to say, you know, uh, and, and has all of this problem made it so if, God forbid, we have another problem, then all of a sudden first responders are going to say, you know what, I'm no, doing that? No, because I represented for many years over 5,000 EMTs and paramedics and worked with... When you say represented? When I was the vice president of the union mm -hmm. before I retired. Um, we'd certainly do it again if we had to. The lesson is, is that we've come far in terms of our training to respond to, you know, events like this. You know, uh, so those are the lessons that we've learned. God forbid something should happen like this again. We're far more trained and have far more equipment to deal with it. That might help us not be in this situation again, where so many members are coming down with so many, you know, illnesses and, and diseases. Mm -hmm. But you know, again, you know, I can speak for my members. You know, when they, you know, rose their their right hand, swore to uphold, you know you know, their job in, in serving and protecting the community, not, they do it all again. I do it all again. You know what I mean? I, I, I do, and, and you have my uh, greatest um, uh, respect out of it. Um, do you have, a, a, and maybe I should ask uh, Mr. London about this, but you can weigh in. Is there further legislation that's going to be necessary, or is this going to be the one, because as I understand, it's going to be uh, active till 2090, which I, I guess, you know, <laughs> we love people to live forever. Well, I'd They're love to be around this. by 2090. Well, exactly. you know, yeah. I don't know, the show. but I'd yeah, love exactly. to. But so. I mean, well, how they came up with 2090, I don't know. But we that's, do this to make sure yeah. that we don't have to keep going back awesome. every five years. Awesome. You know, and that's what you've had to do every time. Awesome. Go back to do. Michael Barish from my law firm started this from the beginning when James Zadroga, right. um, you know, who started this right. whole issue was a client of his. He right. saw it from the beginning, wow. the issues. But the biggest thing is the Stuyvesant High School students, the, the elementary schools in the exposure the zone, people that lived around, yeah. the, the children there, 
they need the protection just as much as the FDNY NYPD sanitation that went in there. Actually, that's an interesting thought because, of course, we think about people who are directly affected. But if there was a child who went back into, into school, the exactly. and then as they become adults, and, and I mean, although now I guess if they were in school, then probably could be 30 years old at this point. Of course. I mean, you never know. Um, is there is there something further that you would like to see that you and, and others would be lobbying for to well, say, well, this is good, but we would still like? For right now, and the biggest part about this is taking it one step at a time. And for right now, we're putting all of our focus into just getting this fund permanently extended so we don't have to march first responders around Congress anymore. We don't have to parade Louis Alvarez around. It's just so John Stewart we get, can get back on TV. <laughs> exactly. Just so we can get some attention to the 9-11 community. Um, it's, it's overwhelming, but still, this isn't a time to celebrate. It's time to just move forward and then really think about how their community needs our help. Maybe I should have asked you beforehand, do you have um, other stories that either are great stories through this process or difficult stories that you'd like to share? We are, I'm, I'm sure you've dealt with many uh, of the people involved. You know, the, the biggest stories and the biggest amazing heart stoppers... You've got about 30 seconds, and we're going to let are, him have 30 ...are seconds. the ones where you give that relief. You be able to get that award for your client so he can take care of his children, take care of his family, and really see his life grow. I had a client who passed away three months after we got his award, and the letter he wrote me just thanking you know, our bless. firm, the community, that he doesn't have to worry about his wife after he passes. Uh, Joe, um, uh, words from you you want to just conclude? Uh, first of all, I will offer thank you so much for everything you do. And thank everything you, you did and everything I'm sure you will thank continue you, to do, and uh, even just being my friend is a nice <laughs> thing. Um, Listen, you know, again, you know, we're here, we're, we're, we're civil servants, EMTs and paramedics and cops, and, you know, this is what we do, and, you know, we'll keep doing it, and um, we'll deal with things as they come, and, um, you know, I've been through many fights in my 56 years on this, this earth, and this fight in of this, <laughs> this fight of pancreatic cancer is just one of many. So you're gonna um, win it. Um, I'm gonna win it. we only have water here, but I'll <laughs> offer a toast to you and all yes. your colleagues, yes. and you. uh, good health for you, Joe, thank especially you, and, and continue on the fight. Yeah, and thank you. Um, we'll we'll uh, you keep do. everybody thank informed. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us, uh, folks. If you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, email them to us at bronxtalk@bronxnet.org. You can send us a tweet at Bronx Talk or you post them on our Facebook page. We thank our producer is Helen Greenberg, the director is William Guzman and Nick Marrero. Every single week we come back. We'll see you next week. Good night.